Can you imagine a restaurant in New York City in the, before the 60s where you would take your food, you'd walk up to the counter and say, here, let me tell you what I took and here's how much I owe. Because there's so much thievery and theft, because our moral standards have dropped, all those restaurants went out of business because everybody steals. That's what he's talking about. Look at our culture. Watch the news. Objective moral values and duties, which we've just proven, show that God exists. In our country, because we don't honor God, we do what we want. Last one, and then we'll be done today. You can measure morality. It's measurable. Can you read that? No matter what happens in life, be good to people. Being good to people is a wonderful legacy to leave behind. If you know the answer, don't answer. Who said this? Want to guess? <laughs> right away, I see your reaction. Right away. Why are you reacting that way? Because what's being said doesn't match the character of that person. Right away in your head, you're measuring morality. That's what you're doing. You see that? When Mother Teresa says this, what's your immediate thought when you see her picture? What do you think of? Compassion. A good person, compassion. When you're watching the 9-11 disaster and you see these people going in, and risking their lives to rescue people, what are you thinking? That's a morally good thing to do. You can measure morality. You can tell. We're not, we act like we can't tell. It's not hard to see. Premise one, if moral values are subjective, then moral codes or actions can't improve or get worse, since there's no standard to judge one code or action is better than another. So you can't tell if it's getting better or not. Yet, I can compare the work of Adolf Hitler versus Mother Teresa or the actions of the firefighters and police. And right away, I can tell the difference between what's an improvement and what isn't. I can tell. Therefore, they're objective. We live in a culture in American culture, where all around us, people ignore Jesus Christ and biblical truth. And we're watching on TV all these arguments and fights over, you know, God just loves everyone and we can do what we want. And yet we just proved that the standard to tell good from evil can't be from us. It has to be higher than us. And therefore, who is it? Well, it's right here. So if it's right here, what does God say about whether or not you really know him. A tree is known by its fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. By his fruit, you'll know him. Right? So then, let's just take a couple minutes on this. So that verse sounds like what's happening is God is saying, how well you perform determines if you know me or not. That's what it sounds like. Right? Is that what it means? What are you thinking? What, is it, what do you think that means? Uh, it's okay. Um, what happens in Christianity, which is really amazing, is God says, um, I'm looking around. I'm sorry, I can't find a good tree. There's none. They're all suck. They're all bad. Right? And he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to impute, I'm going to credit your account as a good tree. It's like, okay, what do I got to do? Nothing. What do you mean nothing? Don't I got to do something? No. Well, how on earth can I be credited for being good in your sight? Because I have this son of mine <laughs> who is the standard of goodness. Matter of fact, he's not just a standard of goodness, he's me. And literally what he's going to do is he's going to solve this problem that you created. And the problem you created is I created humanity to be with me. That's why I created you. I did not create you to be a dog in my property. I created you to be with me. 
and you went ahead and said, I'm going to do what I want. And he says, well, I'm going to love you regardless of you doing what you want. My love for you has nothing to do with you. This is hard to understand. Nobody dates someone who doesn't love them. Nobody does that. We react to how other people feel. God doesn't. He does not react to how you think of him. He loved you anyways. So what he does is he goes, the most important thing about me is my character. I'm not going to lower that for anything. I'm perfect. I'm good. I never lie. I never steal. I'm holy. I'm not lowering it. But here's what I will do. I'll remove what you do that I can't stand. I'll remove it. And I'm going to do that by coming and taking everything that you've done on me and punish myself. (laughs) I'm going to punish myself for you. And guess all you have to do? Trust in me. That's all you got to do. Trust in me and what I've done. And you know what I do? I take my perfection and I credit your account with him. So God never looks at you and says, the reason I love Katie so much is because she's so good. He says, the reason I love Katie so much is because I see my son in Katie and he's good. So forgiveness is not because of what I do. It's because he sees his son. So he doesn't pardon you because you trust him. We have this thinking that the way I can have eternal life is by faith. So if I have faith, God forgives me. It's almost as if I got to do something to get his forgiveness. So if I have faith, now we don't say this, but he kind of owes me because that's the way he set it up. And God says, no, no, actually, the only reason I pardon you is because I'm looking at my son. (laughs) I'm not looking at you. I'm seeing my son in you. And because my son is in you, you're pardoned. That's it. This is hard to understand. But he literally, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for you. Right? That we might become right in God's eyes. Right? If it's through the Son. So in order to be right, God look at you that you're right. He has to see his son. If he doesn't see his son, you're host. You stand in judgment. 